Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the lunch hour seminar on implementation science. I am Martin Suna, an implementation science scholar under the master's program, and I'll be presenting together with my colleague Jane Kavami, who is a scholar under the PhD program. Um, today, we're going to discuss a paper that was saturated a little bit earlier. And it basically discusses adaptation and modification as core tenets of implementation science. A little bit about the presentation outline, we are going to broadly hear about what the article is about, go through the background, the methods, the results, limitations, recommendations for applications, and then we're going to a session of discussion. So about the article that we're discussing today, it is uh, a debate paper in implementation science, basically comparing um, opinions between implementation science scholars. It was published in June 2019 in the BMC Journal of Implementation Science, and it, its main purpose is to examine and expand earlier frameworks about adaptation. One of the frameworks which is um, reviewing is that 2013 version that is then that was modified in 2017 and has finally been modified or expanded in the paper that we are going to review. It is the work of three experts, two of whom authored the earlier formats and all are affiliated with the universities in the US. Two are psychologists and one is a scholar of implementation science. So it's a very I found it a very rich paper. Um, that's the title, it's the frame, which stands for the Expanded Framework for Reporting Adaptations and Modifications to Evidence-Based Interventions. And then about the background in implementation science, which is uh, the process of understanding um, the steps that uh, translate evidence to practice, um, adaptation and modification are critical things, uh, aspects. And uh, adaptation in this, for purposes of today, refers to a process of deliberate alteration of an intervention. Because as you implement a program, you're translating evidence, or this piece of evidence, into strategies and activities that then are going to give you results. So somewhere along the way, most of the times, we have to alter these processes to fit the context and address unexpected challenges that we face in the course of implementation. So if the alteration is deliberate, then that is what we call adaptation. If the modification of the intervention is um, reactionary or in response to something that you had not expected, then that is usually called a modification. So it is good to understand if you're going to um, explain results or outcomes of an intervention, to understand the processes and the steps behind these adaptations. Um, the two, adaptation and modification by consensus, we all know, influence the effectiveness of any evidence-based program or intervention and are therefore critical to implementation science. But historically, they are poorly understood and uh, poorly documented. So um, the earlier framework by Sturman and, and, and others was designed to guide characterization of modifications. Because at the end of it all, as an implementation science um, scholar, you want to be able to explain in detail what worked and what did not work for you to, in relation to what you had designed. So, Sturman and others designed a, a framework that just helps people characterize modifications to be able to tell the story in a more meaningful and richer way. But uh, their framework of 2013 had limitations. It could only characterize but could not document the processes behind the modifications, and yet these are equally important to for us to understand what works and what doesn't work. So in 2017, 
Anna Bowman and others um, reviewed existing literature and also held consensus discussions about this um, modification and adaptation of implementation science book. And in their conclusion, they said that the existing framework needed to be modified, but they also need say one of the key modifications was that we needed to include reasons for adaptation. So this is the, this then led to the new framework of 2017. It was reviewed after uh, Anna and others made strong, two strong recommendations. And uh, I will refer you to the paper that we have. <laughs> I don't know if we have all received it. The side that has a framework. So that was the earlier framework that we are looking at, trying to really help people characterize modification and adaptation in real-wide implementation of, of, of evidence-based programs. And this is what Anna and the others, Anna is uh, Bowman, reviewed in 2017 and said everything else is okay, but we should add um, reasons for adaptation. So this plus reasons for adaptation constitutes the 2017 framework. But the other strong recommendation they made was that uh, their work was not exhaustive and someone should refine the whole framework through review of existing literature and uh, consensus discussions. So a team was put together, a team of three, who actually published this paper. And in their preparatory discussions, they actually noticed that uh, the frameworks had additional limitations and there were opportunities for improving them. So they set out comprehensively refine the framework into what we are going to study today. So this is uh, the earlier framework of 2013. It basically had three, five components. For any adaptation, they needed to, anyone implementation science needed to understand who is making the modification during the process of implementation, what exactly was modified, at what level of service delivery was the modification made, and uh, within which context or setting was the modification made, and what is the nature of the content modification that was made. So then Bowman said, on top of that, we need to add reasons for the modification. Um, so when the three met to improve the framework, they employed specific methods about largely three methods. One was a comprehensive review of the existing literature. They went and reviewed existing articles that discuss processes and methods of um, documenting adaptations and modifications. And uh, in that, they reviewed up to 170 articles. Then they also reviewed two existing framework, frameworks on implementation science and social determinants of health. And then they also reviewed three systematic um, reviews and discussion papers to, that were discussing applications of adaptations and modifications in implementation science. Of course, the, after the desk review of this um, existing literature, they conducted um, qualitative interviews with key informants and to understand the processes and steps that they had taken to, to document the modifications using the case study of uh, implementation of uh, uh, um, an intervention within a mental health facility. So they, they interviewed 55 mental health staff who had been involved in implementation of an evidence-based um, strategy and the purpose for interviewing was to understand the processes and the reasons behind the modifications they had made as they were implementing this strategy. 
So the research assistants then used the notes from these interviews to capture aspects of adaptation that were new and didn't exist in the existing um, framework. So these were reviewed and uh, new, extracts, uh, new aspects extracted and these were later consolidated and categorized, merged in two categories, and then these are what actually informed the new aspects or new additions to the framework that we are going to see. <coughs> Once the draft framework was done, this team of three actually um, called up stakeholders from various walks of life to discuss this framework with them and pick additional uh, opinions and modifications or subtractions from from the room. So, and this is what eventually led to the final framework. This is the most important slide for, for, for the piece that I have to present, and it presents the results of the work of these three, from those three processes. Um, bullets three, four, and five represent aspects of um, the framework that existed in the original 2013 version of the framework. Then bullet eight, which is blue, represents that addition to the four red ones that was made in 2017 after, again, review of existing literature and consensus dialogue discussions. So the additional work by the three people in between 2018 and 2019 um, proposed three additional aspects of the, of the framework. One, they propose that uh, in addition to all the other things, an implementation science scholar should be able to document when and how in the implementation process the modifications and adaptations were made, but should also be able to, to tell us whether these modifications were actually deliberate or unplanned. And at the same time, be able to tell us whether the modifications remained consistent with the original objectives of the, of the intervention, which is called fidelity. Did they actually cause, did they strengthen the outcomes or work to actually undo the desired outcomes? So the three additions are what uh, are Discussed by the, or the, discussed by the, by the, by the three. So then I'll, I'll request that we flip over to the other part of of the pages that we shared, because I know very few of us can read from here. But uh, at the back, it's then what became of the new framework after this this work. So. Um, at the top left hand corner the two boxes in bold are the part of the new additions that these people propose they say on top of everything else the framework should be able to tell us when the modification was made and whether it was planned or not planned that is the second box that is uh, uh, below exactly that one. Then um, it also proposed that uh, I then focus us to the extreme right in the middle section that we need to understand the relationship between the original objectives and uh, the adaptation. Did it function to strengthen or function to weaken the intended objectives of the original? intervention. So that, in summary, is uh, what became of the work of these people. I'll request my colleague to come and add and then lead us into a series of discussions. take us through the next um, slides. 
and in the interest of time, it's going to be a form of discussion so that we can uh, move together, given that Martin has taken us through what was done uh, in terms of adaptation and modification of the framework. And so I thought I would start with um, what could have come in the earlier presentation, but I thought it was better to bring it out now so that we look at it in the context of this framework, but also look at it in the context of um, our daily activities when we think about adaptation and modification. And so these are some of the common reasons for modification, and the same reasons actually apply to uh, the previous discussion uh, when the three scholars were looking at the previous frameworks and also looking at the previous literature. These are some of the reasons why they actually went ahead to modify the framework and one of the important reasons that will lead us into this is improving feasibility and acceptability. And like I said, this applies to this framework, but if we come back to our daily activities, when we are working on, in our different projects, uh, it is important that we think about this in relation to whether we want to improve feasibility and acceptability. It is also important to think about it uh, in terms of increasing um, the reach to our target population, but also when we want to engage um, the people that we are working with and the beneficiaries. Then improving fit to the target population. There are times when interventions are designed, but the target population has not been critically thought about. And so if you want these interventions to actually fit um, their target population, then you want to look at the intervention critically and see whether uh, all the aspects of the target population are actually being addressed. And lastly, uh, is about cultural modifications. Again, in the previous frameworks, this was looked at. And the beauty with cultural modifications is that you address both uh, the content of the modification or the content of the intervention, but you're also able to actually look at the context-specific uh, modifications that may be necessary or that may be required um, in regards to um, in regards to modifying uh, interventions as well as frameworks. So in this paper, we, we were given uh, a number of limitations, and there are three key limitations that they looked at. One is that they didn't employ a systematic review or the traditional thematic analysis because they thought that these did not align to their project goals. Again, looking at what um, we do in implementation science, it is important that as you think about any changes or any adaptations, you have to always align yourself to the project, the project goals. What aspect are you dealing with um, in line with your project objectives and project goals? The other issue that came out in this paper was uh, the use of uh, comprehensive catalogs for the modifications. Um, they, they, they used as they talk about code books and checklists and you know many other things that came from both the literature review, the frameworks they reviewed, and also the systematic review papers that they looked at. And uh, one other uh, issue that comes out in this is that some of these are difficult to actually apply in some of the contexts. Uh, some of us who are engaged in interventions that are in healthcare we know that sometimes you cannot apply these a checklist to certain interventions because uh, they are not previously described very well. And so uh, that is one of the weaknesses that, or one of the limitations that we see with the use of the comprehensive catalogs in modifications of uh, evidence-based pro programs. The other limitation is um, the issue of, uh, you know, how easy it is to actually detect um, uh, adaptations and the associated consequences. At times, implementation is going on, and like Martin said previously, that some of uh, some of the things are deliberate processes that we engage in to improve uh, the intervention. But sometimes, some of the uh, modifications that happen are actually reactive, and so because they are reactive, you end up uh, dealing with it as it comes and uh, it is not very easy to detect when that happens and actually to also think about what are the possible consequences because this is happening as delivery is going on. 
Again, in this paper, we have looked at uh, several strategies for reporting adaptations and modifications, but um, we also get more recommendations for future use, um, but also looking at what was probably not addressed in this, uh, in this paper, but may be very helpful uh, in the future as we think about adaptation and, mod and, and modifications. And one of the recommendations is about uh, using observation as a method. And um, uh, it is also mentioned that actually this is a gold standard for fidelity coding. I think uh, Martin talked about uh, fidelity consistency and also fidelity inconsistency. And that sometimes some of the adaptations and modifications that take place are not, um, are not in line with with, with, with whether they are fidelity consistent or inconsistent. And so observations are very useful, especially in some of those uh, reactive modifications where the provider is not aware sometimes that they're actually modifying the intervention because it is a reactive a way of dealing with the issues that are arising. The second recommendation or the second aspect that is being addressed in this paper is the use of providers or key informant self-reports, and this includes both content level modifications, it also looks at um, level of delivery, and also uh, reasons for modification. And this is useful when um, frequent assessments are required. In cases where you're already uh, in the implementation program, you already have an intervention and you're implementing, sometimes you want to uh, you want to understand these adaptations and these modifications. Are there different aspects when they are occurring? And so using provider or key informant self-reports are very helpful uh, in assessing what type of content level modification is happening, at what level of delivery is it happening, and also why is it happening, which are the reasons for the modifications. Uh, another recommendation that is provided from literature in addition to this framework adaptation and modification is the use of interviews and um, uh, this actually provides rich data than observations. However, this is also subject to the self-report biases where um, you think about uh, some, of the, some of the recall uh, issues and uh, in this case, the interviews are able to answer questions of exactly who made this decision, at what level of delivery, why was this decision made, and also if there are certain contextual factors that are uh, at play there also, you're able to interview uh, either the provider or uh, the beneficiary about some of those factors and how they think they are <coughs> affecting implementation. Uh, when we think about these three, then you also have to think about the other factors that are important. And we are saying that stakeholders and participants in any project, um, in any project implementation, determine what form of assessment to use. So uh, the factors around the stakeholders that you're dealing with, the factors around the beneficiaries, the factors around the participants are very key uh, in determining what form of assessment that you are going to use. Again, think about this in terms, in, in, in terms of um, future directions or implications or moving forward. We appreciate that um, measurement and reporting is coming up, however, it remains a new field and strategies around it continue to evolve. So it is a new area that requires a lot of us to read about, because in most cases, we change things, we modify things, but the documentation and reporting has been very limited. The second aspect is um, that assessments of modification at multiple points, uh, at multiple point times for provides better understanding. So what does it mean? It means that if you, you have done this assessment at a certain point in the implementation period, it doesn't mean that that is the end because there's a lot of uh, evolution that goes on and there are so many other contextual factors that come into play. And so it is uh, important that these assessments are actually done at different point times and this provides a better understanding of who um, is making the decision, why the decision is being made 
how it is being made and um, with what impact it has uh, on the beneficiaries or on the target population. But also it answers the, issue, the, the question of in what context, because again, we know that the context changes uh, with different factors. It is also very important to understand the linkage between modifications and the outcomes. When we are set out to do a certain, um, let's say a certain implementation science study, we already have outcomes at, outlined uh, for this project. But again, we are also learning that as we move on, there are certain modifications that are necessary. Some of them are deliberate, but others are reactionary. And so even as you document these processes, it is important to remain <coughs> aligned to the outcomes, of, um, uh, the outcomes of this project. And also, we make sure that these key outcomes actually uh, keep their focus on uh, reaching the target population, on the diagnostic outcomes, on engagement and acceptability. And you're interested uh, in seeing whether there's an increase, whether there's a decrease, or whether there's no change as you continue with the implementation. And as I conclude, I just wanted us to focus a bit on this to remind ourselves that for an intervention to be effective, it has to be implemented effectively. And so um, if we do otherwise, then uh, you will still, still see outcomes, but the outcomes are not going to be for the actual benefit. And so it is important that as we think about adaptation, modification, and as we think about uh, the continuous assessments at the different points in the implementation period, we always keep an eye on, you know, is the implementation strategy still, what is, that, what is happening at the delivery point, what is happening uh, with the intervention itself, are there any modifications that are required, are there any changes, are there any contextual factors that are coming in play? that we need to think about because um, even when you have an intervention that is very effective, as long as the implementation is not effective, then you're going to get inconsistent, non-sustainable and poor outcomes. So those um, need to remain at the back of our mind um, and as we, as, as we think about take-home messages for probably today's seminar, we have to remember that it is important for both the intervention and the implementation to be effective for us to get the actual benefits and uh, we also appreciate from the previous presenter that there are different factors uh, that we need to think about as we think about modification and uh, importantly we have to always think about individual level factors uh, in terms of in terms of the beneficiaries what are those factors that could affect either implementation and intervention delivery what are the provider level factors uh, what are the social political factors in this paper they mention issues around stigma and other uh, social factors that affect uptake uh, of interventions but also affect implementation we have to pay attention to organizational level factors and these should be considered at other different levels of modifications and um, i think this brings us to our open discussion and questions if there are any thank you so much You actually made this paper very simple to understand. It seemed like it had a lot of Thank you for that good job. So uh, you discussed several things on adaptation, and uh, part of your concluding uh, points were on the different levels that you can adapt, and the video level, and social political, and then you move through this. But I think not to clearly relate this. Uh, Proactive adaptation, non adaptation, and uh, reactive adaptation. I don't know if we can have any other example or something. Can you just help me bring those two dimensions of adaptation into the different Yes, thank you, uh, General Martin. My name is Martin Mokun. Uh, my question is uh, about the fidelity consistency and the fidelity inconsistency. 
So when I look at the framework, I got five framework. Um, let me try I got the framework. For, for an intervention to be successful, I would think that uh, we want it to, to be effective and also to be implemented as planned, and that takes us to the fidelity. But now from this framework, how do we now conclude that the adaptation of being fidelity and consistent or not not consistent? Because there's a lot of information that can be collected, but at the end of the day, how do you conclude? Okay, thank you so much. I will attempt to answer and Martin will also contribute. But also um, the house can So what is about what John raises about the difference between React and we talked about and we discussed. Um, so sometimes when you have an intervention that you have designed, okay, there are certain things that that that, that you may you may um, seek for, for, for you know like like most studies in computer science, you want involvement of stakeholders and many other people at the design level. And so sometimes, at that point, most of the processes are deliberately um, uh, planned, and that process is planned. And whatever changes that happen to the design are actually easier to contribute and report. Because, yes, I have this intervention that I've planned, but I, 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 and I, I want you know, certain input at certain points be modified, so that's the to that kind of thing, not to add on that. And then the reactive aspect is, you thought that you know, all was done, and you go in, but as we begin at the point of the impact, certain issues will come up, that maybe one will not come up. And when they come up, they will have to address them. So if you think about a re-implementation challenges, you know, you work up and you have set up to implement, to implement um, intervention X in certain community. But as you get there, certain issues are going to come up. And so as they come up, then we address them as it well, as it could be the, the implementation. And that is what I consider to be a uh, reactive aspect of the And then we can... John, you have requested an example. And uh, one that typically comes to my mind is uh, Support an HIV, progressive HIV program in West Nile, and uh, part of the packages is providing uh, the retirement medical circumstances services as a preventive uh, intervention for, for the men. But we all know the dynamics in West Nile. So in the program design, you say we shall mobilize through community gatekeepers, the cultural leaders, political leaders, and everything to be able to reach as many men as possible, to be able to circumcise them at the facility and in the community. So that is how you design the intervention, to reach men with that, with that um, service. But uh, then all of a sudden, you get a, uh, a bioelectric <laughs> in, in the region. And uh, for some reason, everything gets politicized. Uh, the imam is going to talk to mobilize, and not go to the radio, to to talk to the masses. So then you have to come up with alternate ways of still delivering the service, which is the home system, to the main in the Western region, um, through different ways. You, get, you then have to find alternate ways of mobilizing. Either use them to satisfy um, customers to grant kind of snowball to mobilize men to come to circumcision as opposed to using the original design of the community gatekeeper. So for some reason, because of something external can no longer support you as it's intended. That's one kind of example that I can think of. So it's, it's 
a, it's a modification that uh, was unplanned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You want to add something? Yes, I wanted to give an example. What came to my mind was at the time the Ministry of Health was implementing option B class. So we sat and agreed on the guidelines and said, okay, for all HIV infected pregnant women, start them on ART, continue it for life, and at whatever point you identify them, start on ART. And for the babies, give development from, from birth to six, six weeks. And when we went out, we started discovering scenarios that we had not thought about. So a baby appears, at six, a mother comes in and the baby is six months of age. And people are asking, do we give development to this baby or not? And then others come and the baby is not breastfeeding. So you identify the baby for the first time at 10 months and the baby is not breastfeeding. Do you give them development or not? So because of that, we started, we started modifying the guidelines and the writing. When we went for the first in the first site, we got several scenarios that we had to change along the way and put agenda to the guidelines. So we had a planned adaptation, but when we started rolling out, scenarios appeared that we had not planned for plan and we had to improve them. But now the documentation of the process is really what the system is. Thank you so much. I guess that's helpful. And we the next um, person who calls and was coming from Matinagin and is asking about fidelity consistent and inconsistency, given that we should always aim to be fidelity consistent. And so again, that is that is the goal for every you know every implementer. You want that the results. Uh, you want to stick to intervention as much as you can. However, as you think about modifications, there are times when it is inevitable that the core elements of the intervention are actually going to be affected. It is not always, but if you are not carefully thought about the context and the content of the intervention, then at the point of modification, you realize that actually you're being, uh, you're swinging away from what you thought were the core elements of the intervention, and then you collectively are coming up with uh, what uh, what, what has been modified and what is not constituting the new um, intervention based on the different aspects, either through stakeholder engagement or through interviews, whatever form that you may use for this, uh, for this uh, modification. And so in that case, it becomes, the modification becomes fidelity inconsistent, mm -hmm. but because you think that that is a uh, modification that is required, then it is termed like that. I also mentioned in the um, third bullet there that it is important to again keep an eye on what is what is the um, what is the linkage between the modifications that you're making and the outcome. So it is at that point that you look at the processes, you look at the reasons why the modification is happening and the type of modification. In that case, we are saying that that type of modification is going to actually deal with the requirements of the intervention, and in that way, then. Um, you're keeping a balance at your outcomes, making sure that you know, you're still achieving the desired outcomes, but then the core intervention in this case has changed. And so it becomes, the modification becomes the I don't know whether there's an ambition for that. Martin also wanted to know how we can easily tell whether it's still consistent or not consistent. <laughs> yes, and uh, somewhere Jane had alluded to it earlier. Monitoring and reporting of this and has several approaches. The most important one is the monitor for fidelity, the proposed use of observation. So, in your regular observation, probably through a supervision team or something, you undertake this. You want to know if you're still, in your implementation, still consistent or deviated. The others are through the self-report interviews that are provided at themselves, and then the structured interviews that she had talked about. Those are the three methods we propose for monitoring implementation of the framework.
Thank you very much. I'm going to request that um, we. I have only two minutes. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask that we have two minutes. Maybe we interrupt with the presenters because some people have to leave. Just have two minutes. And we have a question. What do we. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. But um, I want to. You can talk over lunch. <coughs> Thank you very much. The team has ably put it. Right now, I'm part of an implementation <coughs> program that involves my research and all the things they've said that we are trying to put up a one stop clinic where you bring HIV patients with diabetes, uh, hypertension to come to one clinic. So, getting the CDC HIV clinics and putting them together with the public health NCD clinics. This is what we are going through, the observations, the changes, the modifications. So because of time, I've not been able to share how all the things apply, but they actually apply. So maybe I can share this next time. These are very interesting. Thank you very much, presenters. I think they deserve another clap.